quartet, the gospel in four movements. We're ready for that fourth note. We don't have one witness to Jesus, one canonical scriptural gospel witness. We have four. They don't play a single note. They all have their own voice, but they are all in harmony. Irenaeus, the bishop of Lyon, who was born in the year 130, was the disciple of Polycarp, a martyr, who was the disciple of the Apostle John. So in other words, Irenaeus is the spiritual grandson of the Apostle John. The Apostle John, Polycarp, Irenaeus. And it's Irenaeus who tells us that John wrote his gospel in Ephesus around the year 90, which would mean it was written 60 years after the life of Jesus, when John would have been probably in his 80s at this point. Now, today we're going to look at the fourth gospel, John, the gospel of John. Everyone who has read the gospels knows that John is the different one. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are similar. They're they're very similar. They're alike. They sound alike. That's why we call them the synoptic, because they're similar. But then you get to that fourth gospel. You get to the gospel of John, and it's different. It doesn't sound like the other three. Now, all four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, craft their Gospels not as mere biographers, but as theologians. They have a theological agenda. But John is much more intentionally theological than Matthew, Mark, Luke. It drives how he crafts his Gospel much more than the other three. I'll give you, I'll give you three examples. For example, the cleansing of the temple. Jesus' prophetic protest in the temple. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it all occurs at the first week of Passover, right before Jesus' crucifixion. Jesus stages this protest in the temple, and it accelerates the plot of the temple establishment to kill Jesus. In John's gospel, though, John moves it all the way up to the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. Why does John do that? Because John is not so much interested in crafting a chronology like Luke is, as he's interested in making a theological point. So he wants to, he puts it right next to Jesus' first miracle, the turning of water into wine, immediately followed by cleansing the temple. Why does he do that? He wants that theological juxtaposition. He wants you to see that Jesus is the one who makes wine to keep a party going and then makes a whip to shut down the temple. And you get that strange, jarring juxtaposition of Jesus making wine to keep a party going, making whip to shut down the temple. Another example, this is maybe, this is a very extreme example, Gethsemane. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus is in agony in Gethsemane. He says things like, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful unto death. Pray with me. And he wrestles with the will of the Father. He says, Father, take this cup away, nevertheless not what I will, but what you will. And in Luke, he even sweats blood. In John's Gethsemane account, there's none of that. There's no agony. Jesus is standing above all of that. You see only the divinity of Christ. You don't see his humanity in Gethsemane and John. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's the temple police that are led by Judas to arrest Jesus. In John, there is a cohort of Roman soldiers. That's 600. 600 Roman soldiers come with Judas to arrest Jesus. And when they arrive, and Jesus hasn't had any agony in John, Jesus just goes forth to meet them and says, whom are you seeking? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And John says, or Jesus says, I am. 
and the, the entire Roman cohort falls to the ground. It's a very different picture than what you get in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. What is John doing? John wants to communicate to you that Jesus is the one who's going to conquer the Roman Empire, and they're all going to fall before him. Amen. One more example. Crucifixion. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the crucifixion occurs on the morning after Passover. In John, John moves he moves the crucifixion date to the morning before the Passover meal. Why does John do this? Because John has already announced in the beginning of his gospel that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so John wants Jesus to die at the same time that the Passover lamb is being sacrificed. It's a theological move that he's doing. And we just let it speak to us and we go, amen. This is why John in the Orthodox tradition is called St. John the Theologian. Because he's doing theological work. John organizes his gospel around seven signs. That's the, that's the structure, that's the, uh, the outline, that's the spine that runs through the gospel of John. Around seven signs. He doesn't call them miracles, he calls them signs. And the seven signs in John are turning the water to wine in Cana, healing the royal official son in Capernaum, healing the lame man at the pool of Bethesda, feeding the 5,000, walking on water, healing the man born blind, and raising Lazarus. Now, the purpose of the signs are to point us to faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. In fact, John tells us that at the end of his gospel. John 20, verse 30. Now Jesus did many other signs. It doesn't call them miracles. It calls them signs. In the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these, these seven, are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus preaches... The kingdom of God. In John, Jesus doesn't preach the kingdom of God. He preaches himself. Because John understands that there is no kingdom of God without Jesus Christ at the center as the king. And John makes that very explicit. And so, along with the seven signs, he gives you the seven I am statements of Jesus. John likes the number seven. And so in John, you have these seven I am statements. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the vine. Seven I am statements. So John gives us the highest Christology in all of the four Gospels. There's no doubt in the Gospel of John that Jesus is God. But if we only had had the Gospel of John, we might struggle to really believe that Jesus is fully human. So the synoptic Gospels show us the human side of Jesus. So we see the human side of Jesus in Gethsemane, in agony and sweating blood. We see... The divinity of Christ in John where he stands above it all and says, I am, and the whole world is falling before him. Yes, John gives us the highest Christology, the highest view of the deity of Christ, of the four Gospels, and he's making no mistake about it. He starts off like this, John 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So John, he's 80 years old, maybe older, and it's time for him to make his contribution. He's there in Ephesus, and he's going to start his gospel. How does he start off? He says, well, I read a book one time that started in the beginning. That's a good way to start a book in the beginning. No, he's very deliberate, very consciously. He is imitating the beginning of the Bible. Because one of the things that John is going to show us is that we don't know how to read the Bible until we know Jesus. So in the beginning was the Word. 
the logos, the logic of God, the wisdom of God, the idea, the plan, the vision, God's own reflection upon God's own self. In the beginning was God's understanding in infinite wisdom of God's own self. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This Word, whatever this Word is, this Logos, is God. Drop down to verse 14. And the Word became flesh and lived among us. Ah, yes. And we have seen His glory or His beauty, the glory or beauty of a Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. And so there's no doubt, John, John doesn't mess around. He's not waiting for you to figure out. He tells you right off the bat, first thing he's going to tell you is, Jesus is God. He's the Logos of God, the Word of God made a human being. Now, without question, the greatest revelation about God that I've ever received in all of my life is this. God is like Jesus. God has always been like Jesus. There has never been a time when God was not like Jesus. But we haven't always known this. Now we do. Confess that with me as if it were some new liturgy. God is like Jesus. God has always been like Jesus. There has never been a time when God was not like Jesus. We haven't always known this, but now we do. This revelation completely changed and transformed my theology, my ministry, my life. How did it come to me? It came about 12 years ago. How did it come? During a six-month intensive immersion in the Gospel of John. For six months, I just read the Gospel of John over and over and over and over. Chapters of John I would read every day out loud on my knees. And it's the only scripture I read for six months. I just read John over and over and over and over and over and over. And out of that came this revelation, God like Jesus. Well, God's always been like Jesus. God doesn't change. There's never been a time when God wasn't like Jesus. We haven't always known this, but now we do. I want to show you seven passages, because, you know, John likes the number seven. So I'm going to show you seven passages from the Gospel of John that led me on that path To understand that God is like Jesus. God has always been like Jesus. Never been a time when God was not like Jesus. We haven't always known this, but now we do. Let's get started. We start, the first one is right there. It's the end of the poetic prologue. John opens with a with a poem, essentially. That's what was our gospel reading this morning. And then it ends with verse 18 that goes like this: No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. How do we know what God is like? Well, God is like Jesus. And John says here, no one has ever seen God. Now, you could just say, time out, John. He's there, you know, with his papyrus and his quill there in Ephesus, and and he's writing, no one has ever seen God. And you you peer over him as if you could read Greek, and you say, well, hold hold on now, John. What about what about Abraham? Didn't he see God? You know, he, he had that meal with him near Hebron under the oaks of Mamre. And what about Jacob? Didn't he see God at Bethel with the angels going up and down on that ladder? It says he saw God. What, what about Moses? Moses went up on Mount Sinai, saw God for 40 days and 40 nights, and his face was shining. And then Moses took 70 elders of Israel, took them up on Mount Sinai, and it says they saw God and ate and drank. What about Isaiah? He saw God in the temple in the year that King Uzziah died. What about Ezekiel? He had visions of God by the river Kibar. You would say this to John as he's writing his gospel there in Ephesus in the year 90. 
this old, aged disciple. And John would put his quill down and look at you and say, you don't have to teach me the Bible. I know what it says. I also know that no matter what dreams, visions, revelations, theophanies, Christophanies, epiphanies that people have had in times past compared to the revelation of God that we have in Jesus Christ, no one has ever seen God until now. And you would say, yes, sir. Second passage, John chapter 5. John 5, verse 19. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, the Son can do nothing on His own, but only what He sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. The Father loves the Son and shows Him all that He Himself is doing, and He will show Him greater works than these, so that you will be astonished." The seventh sign, the the culminating sign, the seventh sign is the raising of Lazarus. A man who was four days dead. And that's going to astonish everyone. Of course, there is a surprise eighth sign. But eight is the number of new beginnings. And so the resurrection of Jesus Christ marks the new beginning of a world beyond death. Yeah. The Father loves the Son and shows Him all that He Himself is doing, and He will show Him greater works than these so that you will be astonished. Indeed, just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whomever He wishes. And if you you follow the outline to the seventh sign, it's Lazarus, come forth. And He does, because He, and that's where you have the the, uh, resurrection, the I am statement, I am the resurrection and the life. So, Jesus says, all I ever do is what I see the Father doing. I am the flesh and blood embodiment of the will of my Father. I don't do my own thing. I only do what I see the Father do. In other words, and this is massively important, Jesus does not change the Father. Jesus doesn't change the Father. Any theology that suggests that Jesus is an agent of change upon the Father is a bad theology because now you have a mutable God, a changing God, a mutating God. Jesus does not change God. Jesus simply reveals God as God has always been, but we didn't know it. Also, we see in this passage that the great problem that the gospel ultimately addresses is the problem of death not the problem of sin at least the guilt of sin Uh, they're related but the great problem is God doesn't have a problem with forgiving sin can be forgiven God's that's not the problem the problem is the finality of death threatens to make human life an absurdity and so the real problem the gospel is addressing is the problem of death that's made very clear. In fact, uh, the Gospel of John is filled with dualisms. It's life and death, light and dark, heaven and earth, above and below, spirit, flesh. It's all, it works all the way through it. John chapter 7, verse 28. John 7, verse 28. It's going to be like a Bible study today, but it's going to be a good one. Then Jesus cried out, as he was teaching in the temple. You know me and you know where I am from. Let me pause there. Uh, Some translations insert a question mark there. I think that's probably the better interpretation. Jesus could be saying, you know me and you know where I'm from. Because there there had been this, they were saying, well, we know where you're from and when Messiah comes, we won't know where he's from. And Jesus says, you know me, you know where I'm from. Or he's saying... You know me? You know where I'm from? Leaving it a question. That's The ESV uh, puts a question mark there. And I think actually the question mark belongs. You know me? Really? You sure? You know where I'm from? Really? You sure? I have not come on my own, but the one who sent me is true. 
You do not know him. I know him because I am from him. He sent me. Jesus is teaching in the temple. Jesus is surrounded by the most theologically sophisticated people alive on earth. Jesus is there with the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes, all of whom know the Bible forward and back and have large chunks of it, books of it, memorized. They know the Scriptures. And Jesus says to them, but you don't know God. You don't know my Father. So Jesus is making it clear that in the end, the Bible in and of itself is not enough to reveal God to us. We must have Jesus, and it must all be through the lens of Jesus. Because Jesus is telling these Bible experts, you don't know the Father. Jesus is the true interpretation of the Scriptures. That's, that's important. Jesus is the true interpreter and interpretation of all Scripture. Uh, John 8, verse 19. Then they said to him, Where is your father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. The point of understanding that Jesus is God is to understand that God is like Jesus. Jesus is perfect theology. Just hold on to that. Jesus is perfect theology. People will say, when I say G God is like Jesus, they'll sometimes want to correct me. And they'll say, well, no, Jesus is God. I said, yeah, I know. John tells you that right at the very beginning. Yes, we know that. Yes, Jesus is God. But God is the abstraction that we're trying to define. You know, if I say God, what do I mean? Do I mean Zeus? Do I mean Mars? Do I mean a, a God that is violent and angry and retributive? I mean, God is the subject at hand that needs interpretation. Jesus is the definition of God. So just, you, you say, the point of saying that Jesus is divine, that Jesus is God, is so that you can know that God is like Jesus. That Jesus is the one who provides perfect theology. That is the definition of God. What is God like? God is like Jesus. John chapter 10, verse 27. John 10, verse 27. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. And they follow me. I give them eternal life. And they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. What my Father has given me is greater than all else. And no one can snatch it out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. Well, there you go. There it is. I mean, that's, that's about as plain as you can put it. The Father and I are one. A theology that teaches that somehow Jesus came in order to change the Father in some way is a terrible theology that will lead you down all kinds of wrong paths. Many people have the idea that somehow, you know, God had a disposition toward humanity that was angry, that that God's mood needed to be changed. God's attitude towards humanity needed to be changed. And that, and that Jesus cheered up his angry dad about humanity. Or satisfied his wrath or something like that. No. Because that, that introduces the son as an agent of change upon the father. Jesus does not change God. He says the father and I... We're one. I'm not changing him. I'm making him known to you. Jesus doesn't save us from God. There are whole theological systems that that's what you'll get at. That, that Jesus is changing God or, and that Jesus is saving us from God. God forbid. 
Jesus does not save us from God. Jesus reveals God as Savior. Oh, that's good news. John chapter 12. Got two more here. John chapter 12, verse 44. Then Jesus cried aloud, Whoever believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me, sees him who sent me. I have come as light. This is one of the major themes of John's gospel is light. I have come as light. And in him was life, and the life was the light of men. That's in that prologue. I have come as light into the world so that everyone who believes in me should not remain in the darkness. The The world before Jesus was a world of theological darkness. The world intuited the existence of God or gods, but they didn't know what God was like. And so in most theological systems, I almost want to say all, prior to Christ, you have a God that is angry, that is violent, that is retributive, that must be appeased in some way. Why did all of humanity... Picture God that way. It's because we are projecting onto the unknown what we know about ourselves. We're angry, so God's angry. We're violent, so oh, God must be violent. We're afraid, and so God must be an object of fear. We're retributive, so God is retributive. It's darkness. It's theological darkness. Now, now, it wasn't complete darkness. Well, it was complete darkness except perhaps in the Jewish world. They had the law and the prophets. The law is like the moon. If you have a full moon and a, and a cloudless night, you know, the moon gives you enough light to, to get around. And if you know how to read the stars, you can navigate by the stars. I can't do it, but some people can. I mean, I could find the North Star. What good that'll do me. But okay, that way is north. I don't know anything else, but... But if you know how to read the stars, you can navigate. But still, it's still, the point is, it's still night. The people of Israel, having the law and the prophets, have some light. They're way ahead of everybody else. But they're still in the night. Jesus is not a comet streaking across the night sky. Jesus is the sun of righteousness, risen with healing in its rays. And when Jesus comes, you got to come up with it. It's not night anymore. What is it? Oh, it's day. So when Jesus comes, our theology goes from the Stygian darkness of the pagan world with a little bit of light in the Jewish world to broad daylight. And we know what God is like. As John will say in his first epistle, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. So we can stop projecting the darkness of our anger and the darkness of our retribution, the darkness of our violence on God. No, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And Jesus has revealed that. Ah, I love this. John 14. This is the seventh passage. I I didn't have to write this sermon. I just... I just, had a, I just found my old Bible that I lived in, the Gospel of John, for six months, and I just found my little notes in the margin. I didn't even write them down because I, it's in me, but John chapter 14. Okay, now John 14, this is, this is during the upper room discourse. This is Jesus in the upper room at the Last Supper before his betrayal and crucifixion. This is the climactic moment in John's Christology, what he's been hammering over and over and over, that God is like Jesus, reaches its crescendo right here. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one is going to understand the Father except through Jesus. Without Jesus, you are going to misunderstand God. No one comes to a true knowledge and understanding of the Father except through Jesus. If you knew me, if you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. 
Okay, Jesus is sitting there with the disciples at the upper room, in the upper room at the Last Supper, and he says, if you've, if you've seen him, from now, on, from now on you've seen him. He's talking about God. From now on you've seen God and you know God. Now, now you know God. Now you know. You've seen God. You've seen the Father. Guys, you've seen the Father and now you know him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. And I just see Jesus. Oh. <laughs> Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. That's the whole point. How can you say, show us the Father? I imagine John in Ephesus in the year 90, in his 80s, writing that and going, (laughs) oh man, we were so dense. (laughs) But now we know. And so it all comes to this crescendo. God is like Jesus. God has always been like Jesus. There's never been a time. God, God was never not Christ-like. But we didn't know it. We were in the darkness. We didn't know. So all we could do was project our own ideas, our own maladies, our own toxic spiritual pathology. We projected it on God. But we don't have to do that anymore. Because God is like Jesus. So if we don't see it in the Jesus revealed to the disciples, it's not part of our theology. It's not part of our Godology. It's not part of our ology about the Theo. <laughs> we, we don't come up with ideas about God that we don't see embodied in the life of Jesus. Now, when I say God is like Jesus... How does that strike you? Does it, does it come to you as good news? To me, it's like, whoo, that's the best news I've ever heard. I mean, if, if, if God is like Jesus, I'm thinking, hey, we're going to be all right. We're going to be all right. We're going to be all right. Church, you're going to be all right. You're going to be all right because God is like Jesus. The one in charge is like Jesus. The omnipotent one is like Jesus. He's going to take care of you. You don't have to worry because taking care of business is his name. Bonus points if you know where that's from. Stand up with me. I haven't even looked at the clock. How are we doing? We had a little bit over. We had all the kids singing all that. I'm not, I'm not going to look at the clock because I'm going to say what I came to say. Amen. Let's just, just humor me one more time. Just, just for the fun of it, one more time. Join me. God is like Jesus. God has always been like Jesus. There's never been a time when God was not like Jesus. We haven't always known this, but now we do. I mean, now we really do. Amen and amen.